And so speaking of which, our final presentation <laughs> is called Impacts of Anthropological Analysis on Aboriginal Peoples, Disentangling Methods and Theories in Archaeohistorical Narratives by Professor Ian Davidson. Say that fast three times. Um, Professor Davidson is Emeritus Professor at the University of New England in Australia. He began his appointment at UNE in 1974, was awarded a personal chair in 1997, and was named Emeritus Professor in 2008, when he was appointed Visiting Chair of Australian Studies at Harvard University for 2008-2009. His work has focused on Spanish Upper Paleolithic archaeology and ethnography of Northwest Queensland, Australian rock art, archaeology and heritage, colonization of Sahul, language origins, and cognitive evolution. Davidson has worked on projects with 10 different Aboriginal groups in three states of Australia and has undertaken major research projects rising from archaeological consultancy for many of Australia's leading industries, including BHP, Rio Tinto, Woodside, and Glencore. He has been a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities since 1994, was awarded the Rhys Jones Medal of the Australian Archaeological Association in 2010, and is a member of the 2015 Excellence in Research for Australia, the Research Evaluation Committee for the Humanities and Creative Arts. He received his PhD from Cambridge University. Professor Davidson will be presenting at the Bard Graduate Centre tomorrow evening at 6 on Iconicity, Conventions of Representation in Prehistoric Art and the Modern Mind. He will also be presenting on Friday at Columbia University. <coughs> but tomorrow it's as part of the Indigenous Arts in Transition series here. If you enjoy his talk this afternoon, and really there is no reason you would not, <laughs> please register and come along to his talk tomorrow. One final note of introduction for Ian is I was fortunate to be one of his two last PhD students ever. Now, I don't claim that this is his, has that changed? <laughs> oh my God, I'm shattered. Um, <laughs> it, um, in any case, I don't claim that it's his greatest single achievement, but it is the one fondest to me. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, Sean, who after today will forever be known as Frontier Sean. <laughs> I would like to thank the Bar Graduate Centre for making it possible for me to, to be here and to congratulate Sean on his excellent book um, and uh, exhibition and, of course, this symposium. I begin public presentations in my adopted country, Australia, by acknowledging the prior claims of the indigenous people. In New York, of course, we can acknowledge that in 1626, Peter Minuit gave goods valued at 60 guilders to an Indian called Seisays and regarded it as a purchase. That Seisays probably did not have rights to make a sale and much more probably did not have a concept of the transfer of land in exchange for other material goods is the least of the problems of the interaction. The history of interactions between settlers and indigenous peoples is littered with such misunderstandings which never turned out very well for the native inhabitants. In this talk, I shall address some questions about how such misunderstandings arise and the impacts they've had. We continue with such misunderstandings and they still do not turn out well, particularly not exclusively, but not exclusively for the indigenous people. Although we have heard some very nice examples today where good people are trying to turn the tide. How do I turn it on? There we go. A recent speech by a member of the Australian Parliament, albeit one born and raised in South Africa and about to lose his position, <laughs> highlights the problem I want to address. And I'm, going, I'm afraid I'm going to read it because it's brutal. I agree with the former Prime Minister when he refers to Indigenous Australians' choice to live in remote communities as a lifestyle choice. In essence, if the noble savage lifestyle a la Jean-Jacques Rousseau, I don't think he pronounced it quite as well as that, the same one often eulogised is true, then there is nothing stopping any Indigenous men or women from pursuing such an existence on their own. Just do not expect the taxpayers to subsidise it. My contention is that the ideal of the noble savage may be less sanguine and altogether more Hobbesian, nasty, brutish, and short. 
Dennis Jensen was very sophisticated for an Australian po politician in, in knowing that Hobbes and Rousseau existed <laughs> and in expressing a preference about the stereotypes they are used to represent. He also stated, Australia was invaded over 200 years ago. No Australians, regardless of race, were alive at that time. So none suffered directly as a result of that invasion. Australia is not the only country with problems about ignorance amongst its politicians. You're supposed to laugh there. <laughs> My serious point is that we in the anthropological disciplines have a responsibility towards the people whom we study. In particular, a responsibility to counter ignorance among non-Indigenous people about the history, and I would say archaeo-history, of indigenous peoples who constitute minorities in settler societies. In this case, Jensen, with Abbott, was showing ignorance of an undisputed history. James Cook encountered and shot at Aboriginal people in Botany Bay in 1770. A Gwergal man opposed the landing and left behind a bark shield, this one, when he ran away. We could say that this tells us two things. One, the owner of the shield was alive at that time, despite what Mr. Jensen said, when the, uh, when the 1778 invasion was first implied. And two, the history of suffering began then. Cook collected the shield, not the prettiest object ever made by Aboriginal people, the sort of thing a colleague told me was not really museum quality which has been in the British Museum since and was recently in the National Museum of Australia for a visiting exhibition. There are a couple of other interesting features of this testament to the first interaction between Aboriginal Australians and British officialdom. The whole appears to have been made by a spear, as noted at the time it was collected, though that may not be the best way of corroborating it, and thus not an indication of the English opening fire but of pre-European conflict. And the bark of which it, is, it was made is from a mangrove species not known within 500 kilometres of Sydney, thus indicating networks of connection unimagined by 21st century right-wing politicians or 18th century mariners. The view that Aboriginal people are exercising lifestyle choices by living in remote communities seems to stem from ignorance of such history and almost implies that they are descendants of the original European settlers misguidedly living in the desert as demented hippies. So here's the thing. Over more than 200 years of written knowledge about Aboriginal people has not generally succeeded in getting through to non-Aboriginal people the positive messages that are accessible there about the Aboriginal people who have been living in Australia for at least 50,000 years. The stereotype being addressed by Jensen is one that was created in Europe in the 19th century. At first, whatever knowledge of Aboriginal people reached Europe was put to work to show that earlier simplistic generalizations about non-European people were true. Later, a variety of interests failed to cut through that there was a better story to tell. That is changing the, those preconceptions a bit now. But it has taken a long time and much damage was done along the way. The key philosophical discussions to which Jensen was referring were published about a century apart and have two things in common. First, they were discussions of a hypothetical construct of how people went from being in a state of nature to the sorts of civil society, that is European society, however in uncivil they may have been, that the political philosophers thought ideal. Second, although information about non-European societies was beginning to reach Europe, the philosophers generally ignored such evidence in favour of argument based on more general knowledge of the Bible and the classics, and on thought experiments. Hobbes was principally a thought experiment. This despite the fact that Montaigne 
had drawn philosophical conclusions from the evidence of the native inhabitants of the Americas more than half a century before Hobbes. These works are closely related in time to the earliest accounts of Australian Aboriginal people. The earliest published de de description of Australian Aboriginal people was by the English pirate and buccaneer, William Dampier, in 1697, who set the pattern for others to follow. He described people in Western Australia as the miserablest people in the world, who have no houses and skin garments, sheep, poultry and fruits of the earth. Notice how important it was that they had no houses, clothing or agricultural product. This has been an ongoing theme. While Hobbes had shown interest in lasting dwellings, he could not have known about this, but Rousseau could. Eighteen years after Rousseau's book, James Cook, whose voyages only seemed to be more colourful than those of Dampier, at least on this map, echoed Hobbes <laughs> in talking about the pure state of nature and echoed Dampier in referring to the most wretched of the earth. He too emphasised the hunting and fishing subsistence and the lack of cultivation. We could go on, but in general discussion was speculative. When there was some attempt to evaluate the evidence coming from the Americas, it led to speculations about the relative importance of different means of subsistence. <coughs> we see here that although the 19th century really set the tone of Aboriginal disadvantage, the seeds had been sown by speculative writing in the 18th century, even before Australia was invaded. But more systematic evidence began to emerge in the 19th century, together with a consolidation of attitudes to theory. As with other places and peoples, much of what was described in the early 19th century was a ragbag of unsystematic observations, sometimes little different from tra travellers' tales. In a full documentation of my argument, I need to address some issues about the organisation of all sorts of knowledge about Australian Aboriginal people. The relevant disciplines encompass the subfields of anthropology, although I shall have nothing to say today about the, ling the, uh, the linguistics. Clearly, it is beyond the available time and your desire to get to a reception and my abilities as a scholar to address the whole history of all of anthropology in a few minutes. So my account will be selective and relatively brief, I hope. The description of the physical form of Ab Australian Aborigines began with Dampier then with Cook's first encounters in Sydney. We can identify two distinct threads in these descriptions of the physical characteristics of Aboriginal people. First, they start from purely descriptive, if selective, features. Skin colour, bodily proportions and hair type. Second, they speculate how similar people were to other known groups, particularly to Africans or Indians. The two threads were obviously related but the second was not necessarily a description. And later, once the fossil record of prehistoric human ancestors began to be revealed, particularly through the discovery of Neanderthals in Belgium, Gibraltar and Germany, how did knowledge of the physical form of Australians illuminate the understanding of those fossils? Sometimes it took the form of comparing Australians to fossils, as in the picture. Sometimes, as here, it took the form of considering the range of variation exhibited by Australians as informing the range of variation possible on the in the fossil record. Of course, behind that more sophisticated approach, there is still an assumption that Australians were uh, an appropriate population for comparison. The argument, as Lyle quoted Huxley, depended on assumptions about the purity of races. In the 1920s, A.C. Haddon, from Cambridge University in England, wrote a book on the races of man, which produced an elaborate scheme of the races, their characteristics, similar similarities to other races, and names according to his classification. By implication, pure races. The Australians were in a hierarchy of classes as unused subsequently as they were unpronounceable. They share this classification with various tribes from India. I'm not sure that this classification ever went anywhere, but the idea of a connection to India did persist until relatively recently. One of the later dominant views of the variation amongst Australian Aboriginal people was an attempt by the American Joe Birdsell to account for variation 
as resulting from different mixtures of pure races that colonised at different times, what he called successive waves of immigrants. Sounds familiar. He worked on this with his South Australian colleague Norman Tyndale, best known for his mapping of the distribution of the Aboriginal tribes and, the, and language groups. It is worth noting that there was some emphasis on studying what were called full bloods, partly for obvious reasons, because otherwise both method and theory would not allow them to understand variation. This approach to explaining the variation in physical form of peoples was, of course, grist to the racist mills of the 1930s, but arguably arose from the 19th century attitudes to racial variation, and particularly that found in fisher-gatherer hunter peoples. In pursuit of this, Birdsell undertook field research in Australia for a Harvard PhD completed in 1941. He concluded that the variation could be accounted for by three sources of immigrants, negritoids from Southeast Asia, the very small people shown in the photo with Birdsell on the right, an Ainoid strata from East Asia, and vedoids from Peninsular India. Despite argument to the contrary, he maintained his stance until his death in 1994. Birdsell was a good enough scientist to have collected data that could serve to evaluate his own hypothesis and to make it available after his death. Two separate analyses have shown that there are significant relationships between the values Birdsell measured and environmental variables consistent with what we know of the impact of environment on body form for a wide variety of animals. Birdsell's own interpretation reflected the priorities of a research tradition that had its roots in the 19th century. It turns out that, that, that the breakthrough in sorting this all out came because of that weird interest in hair as a defining racial characteristic. On the 18th of September, 1923, A.C. Haddon stopped at Golden Ridge Railway Station on the Nullarbor Plain in Western Australia. Believe me, that is such an evocative description. It is literally a flea speck. You can't find it now on Google Maps. When he got back onto the train, he had a sample of the hair of an Aboriginal man who had been on the station, which he gave to the anthropology department at Cambridge University. And you may ask whether that was informed consent. Using DNA from this hair, Rasmussen and Willislev's team analyzed a whole genome of one Australian for the first time. This led to further speculation about the relations of Australians to people in the rest of the world. Their conclusion was that the ancestors of Aboriginal Australians split from the Eurasian population before Asian and European populations split from each other between 62 and 75,000 years ago. It is wonderful what you can do when you have one sample and a very thick pencil. More recent DNA work has increased the sample size to 13 and concentrating on the Y chromosome unique to males has shown that there seems to be almost no recent contribution to Australians from India since before the date of colonisation of Australia. Thus it has taken the most complicated technology applied to humans to show that one of the fundamental conclusions about human variation made in the 19th century was wrong. Let us switch our attention now to social anthropology and don't think you're going to get away lightly. Let us switch. Uh, the, I understand that in the city of Boaz and Mead, it would be more usual to refer to cultural anthropology. But in some views, Australia was the location of the birth of the British tradition of social anthropology, although Radcliffe Brown and Malinowski, as, uh, through uh, Radcliffe Brown and Malinowski, as well as providing the material for Durkheim to cut his teeth. New York, the state of Lewis Henry Morgan, has claims to the origin of kinship studies in anthropology, which became one of Radcliffe Brown's distinctive interests. And there is a trail of evidence that Morgan's questionnaires about kinship made their way to Australia, shown in this family tree here, and that um, Morgan's remarks about Aborigines were a result of information from people who did actually know at first hand, such as Fison, the same Fison who did the Fijian study that Sean referred to earlier and others who used more widely known sources such as Tyler and McLennan. But the interesting author for our study is Lubbock. In 1865, John Lubbock, synthesizing the evidence from prehistoric archaeology shortly after the publication of Origin Species, of Species, padded out the archaeology using a rag bag of observations of modern people gleaned from accounts of what he called travelers and naturalists, 
in a race to the bottom, the lowest scale of civilization. To do this, he collected evidence of food, clothing, ornaments, rafts, implements, throwing sticks, boomerangs, fire, etc. This allowed him to make a more systematic uh, comparison in a table, which he was sure would throw some light on the remains of savage life in ages long gone by. Any search for pattern in this table seems likely to conclude that there was no pattern to the distribution of technological items among the societies he considered. The rankings sought by Cook, Darwin and others could not be derived from such comparison even though it was systematic. This table appeared in the first edition in 1865 and preceded the evolutionism of Tylor and Morgan who suggested, following Montesquieu, that there were peoples in the modern world in stages of savagery, barbarism, and civilization, but that there was an evolutionary progress from one state to the other. It followed, therefore, that savages, fisher-gatherer hunters, represented an early stage of human existence. This was to counter an alternative argument that savages were degenerate varieties of more civilized societies. Morgan argued that Mankind commenced their career at the bottom of the scale and worked their way up from savagery to civilization in the seven ages that Sean referred to earlier, not the seven ages of man made famous by Shakespeare, um, but let's at least note it on the 400th anniversary of his birth. By contrast, Baez argued that such evolutionist approaches to archaeo history of modern peoples were completely inappropriate. Yea, Boaz but Australia did not really have a Boaz. Then, in the 1890s, two major pieces of work changed the whole game for Australia. Both involved graduates of Oxford University in England, where, together, they had studied under Tylor. One of these was by Baldwin Spencer, professor of biology at Melbourne University, who worked with Frank Gillen, a senior worker on the Overland Telegraph, who had been in the Northern Territory for 20 years. Together in 1899, they published the first detailed study of a single Aboriginal tribe, the Arunta, who lived around Alice Springs. Gillen spoke rudimentary Arunta, uh, Spencer spoke none. The other was by Walter E. Roth, a medical doctor who worked alone in northwest central Queensland, the area in the oval, uh, the rectangle. Um, and within two years, researched, wrote, and in 1897 published one of the first field-based studies of Aboriginal ethnology, a foolish, including a foolish documentation of the Pitta Pitta language, acknowledged by modern languages, uh, linguists, his documentation, as correct, good, or accurate, and of sign language, which Spencer and Gillen didn't uh, study. These are massive works, both the uh, Arunta study and the Northwest Central Queensland work. But I only want to point to two things about them here. First, Gillen was the originator of the name The Dreaming, or rather Dream Times, to describe the belief system of the Arunta. The second thing is the relationship between Spencer and Gillen on the one hand and Roth on the other. A little nervous talking about this bit in front of Fred, but never mind. The concept of Dream Times, or The Dreaming, refers to various belief systems in, the, in Aboriginal Australia that are about the relations between people and place, about the creation of those places, such as the one shown in this photograph, and about the relations between people in consequence of that history of creation and their place in it, and a time that Stanner memorably referred to as every when. As Fred Myers documented for the Pintaby, adjacent to the Arunta near enough, Sometimes dreams belong to the dreaming, sometimes not. The term itself began in a, in a slightly innocent way before the publication of the outcome of Gillens and Spencer's research and some part of their discussion of the concept for which they generally used the Aronta word uh, El Chiringa was claimed at countering the claims by the Lutherans who were at work nearby seeking to convert Aronta people that it referred to what we would now call a high god. In other words, Spencer and Gillen didn't think there was a high god amongst the Arunta. According to the late Patrick Wolfe, the name got applied to a variety of different manifestations because of the limitations of members of settler society gathering data about Aboriginal religion, including the Uwalai, 
uh, who are much further south and far away, who did have a high god called Bayami. It was not applied because anyone demonstrated that there were similarities between the religious manifestations in different places, but because it was a convenient label which enabled them to talk about those different manifestations. Stanner wrote that there were subtle and probably important variations in different regions, and the label stuck to the concept Aboriginal religion, not to any particular version of it, as a means for settler society to simplify what is still a tremendously com complex cosmology. Just to orient you then, um, if you're not familiar um, with Australia, I've highlighted in this recent map of Australian languages the Arunta, studied by Spencer and Gillen, the Pitta Pitta, studied by Roth, the Pintipi, studied by Fred, and the Ualai, studied by Langlo Parker. It is difficult to avoid the impression that some part of the discussion was determined by the presence of James Fraser, sitting in his study in Cambridge, England, compiling his massive synthesis of world magic and religion. That's not to scale. His, uh, the, the, the books are... <laughs> with the purpose of showing that there were origins of religion. Indeed, one of Spencer's letters to Fraser showed just how selective he was, uh, he was being when he passed on information to Fraser. It's phrased in terms of, I found something that you might find interesting. The other things he didn't pass on possibly tarnishing the leaves of the golden bough. Fraser's review of the Spencer and Gillen study, however, showed exactly how he approached the savages from Australia, as people who stand in the present day near the point of culture of the beginnings of our race. They were not interesting in their own right, just as exemplars of the lowest stage of humanity. While there was little attempt to suggest that the Arunta, as presented by Spencer and Gillen, were more than 20 years after the Overland Telegraph went through, untouched by settler society, there was some pretense. As the main picture shows on the left, Aboriginal women early in the records by Spencer and Gillen, this is 1895, were comfortably wearing clothing. And um, Gillen uh, recorded that they were uncomfortable about his attempts to photograph them naked for Spencer. Their comment was, very good longer bush l bushy lubra, no longer station lubra, or something like, it's all very well for women from the bush, but it's not okay for women who are settled on pastoral properties. This testimony makes it all the more obvious that the photo of a ceremony in 1901 on the right mixed naked men and at least six clothed women. In striving to document the tradition, it seemed necessary to downplay the extent to which claims for authenticity were false. And in the catalogue for the exhibition, Sean has shown how Spencer was determined to ignore the entanglement of settler and Aboriginal society in his studies and collections. Spencer and Roth were students together in Oxford, but both ended up in Australia. Spencer in Melbourne and Central Australia, Roth most famously in northwest central Queensland, and later as protector of Aborigines for Queensland. The point of comparison here arises from Roth's work as a medical doctor in Bulia and Cloncurry. Appointed in 1894, his work, Ethnological Studies in, a Northwest, in Northwest Central Queensland, was published in 1897, which included, with the language study, documentation of ceremony, mythology, economy, and material culture, none of which appears in, um, or not very much of which appears in Spencer and Gillen. Gillen wrote to Spencer about Roth's work in March 1898 with extensive comments, some praise, some corrections, and some additions, such as connecting a ceremony that had arrived in Alice Springs to the Malonga ceremony that had been traded through Bullia before the publication of Roth's book. The men in the photograph, in the middle of the slide, were dressed for that ceremony in Bullia, and the rock art on the right is uh, an image that we found during my research in the region. For all the good things Gillen had to say, he added some scorn, that the ceremony was interrupted to take tea or supper, as if that somehow diminished the value of the ethnography by making the ceremony less authentic, and authenticity was the key. Likewise, he poured scorn on Roth's observations about totemism, saying, I'm seriously meditating a descent upon the Pity Pity tribe, a lovely 
alteration of the name that is only spelt in, uh, as Pitta Pitta in uh, Roth's book, to find out something in their totem system. I hear that the blacks in that country speak English like white men, and I feel confident that I could unearth and clear up their system in a fortnight. <laughs> Perhaps Gillen had, was not recognising that the people Roth was working with had uh, suffered a vicious war with the settlers for six years, including what is sometimes described as the only pitched battle on Australia's soil. Walter Roth wrote of the devastation of the Aboriginal communities as a result of the invasion of pastoralists and the ins institution of the native mounted police. What with privation, disease, alcohol and lead, the whole community has been annihilated. The photograph of the rifle is a postcard from Queensland, now in the British Museum and recently on display at the National Museum of Australia, of a, a rifle. And the handwritten message on the back of the postcard says, this is a photo of an old Snyder carbine used in early days by native police. The marks on the stock are the tally. I counted 24. The first massacre in northwest Queensland happened following the killing of a pastoralist called Molvo, his grave indicated in characteristic Australian understatement on the right. In 1878 at Wanamore Waterhole, which was a dreaming site for the yellow belly, a species of fish. A young woman, Rose, survived that massacre and she had a son, Willie, with the policeman who led the massacre. I leave you to work out how that happened. The photograph of the waterhole shows my friends Tom and Dory, siblings who were the children of Willie, shortly before Tom passed away. At, and they're at Wanamore Waterhole. The question of authenticity is nowhere more obvious than in museum studies. Sean Rowlands will have told you about his work on Roth's collections from that part of the world. The question, um, the, Sean also made a fundamental observation, which is what has led us here to this exhibition today. One of my colleagues remarked at the exhibition where the postcard and shield were on display that some of the objects were not of museum quality, as I've said. It would appear that the collection Roth sold to the Australian Museum contained the objects that were of museum quality, while those for the, uh, for the Queensland Museum were often less spectacular and did not conform to the preconceptions of how materials would have been before settler contact. But this was, um, where have we got to? Yes, Th this was more interesting than it had been thought because Sean was able to show the inventiveness. And so here's the museum quality and here's the non-museum quality. Um, Sean was able to show the inventiveness of the Aboriginal people in adapting the new materials to their own purposes, in this case, using a steel blade on what would otherwise have been an ad tipped with stone. It is this entanglement that we celebrate here today. Both Roth and Spencer had studied at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, England. Their collections in that museum enabled Pitt Rivers to compare the forms of weapons and prepare diagrams such as this which would, could be interpreted as showing something like a history of the changes in the technology of warfare. In reality, this did not show change, but contemporary variation in form. Nevertheless, the studies by American Donald Davidson sought to use the variation in museum collections to work out historical process and origins. In a series of papers, Davidson explored the variation in Australian material culture and its distribution across the continent. These are fundamental studies, and I often like to say that what Australian archaeohistory needs is more studies by Davidson. But his work became unfashionable, some of us never got fashionable, because of the diffusionist argument. The data are still good and important, but people did not like the interpretation. For our purposes, though, it demonstrated variation in Aboriginal cultures that is unexpected in the 19th century models of people on one of the lowest rungs of the ladder, as savage hunter-gatherers in a world that had progressed to agriculture. In other words, there was never any discussion of what the variation could be within hunter-gatherer societies. It showed that the variation was worth studying in its own right as part of the story of Australian people, and without reference to what it might say 
about the relations between Sahul, the greater Australian continent, and the rest of the world. And so we come to archaeology. I'm not going to be very long on archaeology. So were Australian Aborigines really stuck on that bottom rung? Or was there a bottom rung at all? The idea certainly lasted for a while after Lubbock and gained its extreme expression under Solas, who in 1913 wrote about uh, ancient hunters and their modern representatives. But it persisted in unexpected ways. If the dominant means of interpreting archaeohistory depended on unsophisticated parallels between modern societies and selective aspects of the archaeological record, as it did, it might help in telling a story about the European past, but there was going to be a problem investigating the archaeology of those modern representatives, and there was. Following the logic of the use of modern representatives to, representatives to say something about the past of Europe, archaeology of Australia, such as that by Hale and Tyndale at Devon Downs in 1929, should have shown that the lower layers of sites looked like the modern material culture of Tasmania, and it did not. There was nowhere to go then, and archaeology languished for 30 years until John, until John Mulvaney's excavations at Fromm's Landing in 1959. Archaeology is at its best, showing changes through time. It can be used to construct stories about the past that I call, I'm calling here archaeohistory, but these are views of the past that are alternative to Aboriginal songs and uh, dreamings about the symbolic making of the world in the dream time. Yet one of the contributors to archaeohistory is about the way in which the symbolic world of the past changed through time and space. In at least four regions, the art styles changed through time. I've just selected four where it's particularly well documented. The styles were different from region to region at each time, at each stage. The big blocks of colour are approximately contemporary and the pattern of changes from one of those blocks of time to another was different in each uh, region. And in the later phases, there were more regions with rock art, and again, these were regionally very distinctive. And the arguments about how rock art was used in each region are also diverse, though it may be too early to say whether this is because there were different social processes in each region, which I suspect, or that different archaeologists were doing the interpretation, which is probably also true. What seems certain is that the symbolic construction of the world that characterises the Aboriginal communities that we have been talking about had a rich history of working out how to relate to each other and to the external world throughout the 50,000 years of their occupation of Australia. And most importantly, this is all change within what we have since the 19th century been happy to call fisher-gatherer-hunter societies. If we go back to those 19th century arguments about savagery, barbarism and civilization, or even to Dampier and Cook talking about the Australians not cultivating plants nor raising sheep, we see that there has been a persistent story that Australians were fisher-gatherer-hunters and that the continent, at least in its rare moments of high sea level isolation from New Guinea, was a continent of hunter-gatherers. And the 19th century left us little language to describe change within such societies, only language about change away from being savage hunter-gatherers. At various times, snippets of ethnography about planting the tops of yams after harvesting and other features have been interpreted as indicating that there was, a, there was more of an agricultural or horticultural element to Australian subsistence than the 19th century stereotypes have suggested. More recently, Careful analysis of plant distributions has shown that at least the greater yam, Diascaria, Diascaria alata, must have been introduced to Northern Australia as a cultivated plant and survived by being cultivated. The authors speculate that this and similar evidence could be remnants of a now abandoned horticulture based on banana, taro and yams introduced from New Guinea. What I want to suggest is that the question of whether there was some form of agriculture in Australia may actually be a product of the oppositions that were set up in the 19th century and before. Then the question was what rung these savages occupied. I suggest that when Lorandos questioned whether the arrival of Captain Cook uh, 
caused experiments with agriculture to be nipped in the bud, he was actually reflecting that approach and seeking to enhance the status of Aboriginal people using a hope that was false because it derived from the very theoretical approach that had already appeared to condemn them. Instead, I suggest that there is abundant evidence that resources were managed. They were managed by Aboriginal burning, what Rhys Jones called fire stick farming. They were managed by respect in, engendered in the songs and totemic, totemic associations, and they were managed by mobility both to avoid shortages and to group together for ceremony when local abundances were available for sharing. I remember a story told by Rhys Jones of his Gijingali friend Frank Gurmanamana visiting him in Canberra. On hearing that no one now knew the songs and knowledge by which the Aboriginal people of Canberra had lived um, in the past, he said, this country been lose him dreaming. And he regarded it as a place of wilderness and primordial chaos, in Jones's words. This problem, it seems to me, resides in the characterization of the process of archaeohistory as one where progress happened from fisher-gatherer hunting to agriculture, where people who lived in society, societies that depended on, agri on agriculture I don't know what I was going to say there. <laughs> um, it, was very good. it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, where pe people who, who lived in societies that depended on, on agriculture um, passed judgment on people who didn't have it. Let me end, nearly end, with the words of Udru Nunakal in this wonderful, wonderful poem. Let no one say the past is dead. The past is all about us and within. Haunted by tribal memories, I know this little now, this accidental present, is not the all of me, whose long making is so much of the past. A thousand thousand campfires in the forest are in my blood. Let no one tell me that the past is wholly gone. Now is so small a part of time so small a part of all the race years that have moulded me. Now is so small a part of time. Archaeology is a set of methods that has the potential for Aboriginal people to discover that long making. All I can do is assist if they want me to and uncover the deep-rooted theoretical flaws that made the process of writing archaeohistory so controversial in the past. I end then with the image that has been without, behind all that I have said, quite literally. The great painting of the Wichiti Grub Totem, an Aranta dreaming, it is now one of the major tourist attractions near Alice Springs. It is in the gorge now called Emily Gap. And the photograph of it, in the Spencer and Gillen volume of 1899, shows not only its scale, but the extent of changes in landform over a little more than 100 years. The painting, which was part of the sacred rituals, has become a tourist attraction. The Aboriginal people who performed the rituals there remain, in the 19th century photographs, dignified and naked, part of the stereotype of how Aboriginal people ought to be. I don't agree with it. But it can also be a means to describe that long making that is so much of the past. My final point, though, is that the way we do that description is not free of the preconceptions we bring to it. It is entangled itself. That is, of course, what we are celebrating here. We can only understand the long making of the people whose past we are investigating if we understand recursively the long making of our ways of studying the past. Ignoring that really affects the lives of modern Aboriginal people through the ignorant development of policy by politicians. time, I suppose, if people want to hang about and <laughs> ask some questions. I also think it's only fair that perhaps some people ask some questions to Sergio. There is a reception right now outside, if you do want to go out there and just informally mingle and ask some of the presenters about their talks. Um, 
I just want to say that I'm hugely impressed with um, what I saw today with the presentation. I feel um, rather honored that I put this line up together. And of course, I can claim absolutely 100% of the credit <laughs> for its success. Um, another informal comment. Thank you, Ian, for showing that photo of me at my graduation <laughs> ceremony. I look so young and full of hope. Um, <laughs> And it wasn't all that long ago either. I just, <laughs> so so <no. laughs> I just have one comment to feed off uh, your earlier framework of, of this paper with um, the comment by one of our charming politicians uh, back home that no one is alive from 200 years ago to be offended about this war, as if, for a start, even if that was a moral point that you could argue, um, for a start, Europeans did not arrive and then conquer the whole thing in one single instant. This conquest went on for up until at least 1930. Uh, and in my exhibition, I have the shield that I pointed out from the Umbulgari community, um, which is associated with the Forest River massacres, which happened in 1926. Um, and the last of official massacre by police of Aboriginal people <coughs> was in 1928 in Coniston. Um, now, there are people who remember their parents telling them about these experiences. You know, they grow up and uh, these stories get, get passed along. So it's not at all an issue about this thing being 200 years ago. This is, as you say, time is a, is a small issue. This happened yesterday. Um, but the right-wing narrative, in, not only in Australia, but in many countries, would rather brush that under the carpet um, for a for a nationalist, progressive view of history. Um, I don't have a question on that, but I just felt that I needed to make that comment. I, I, I put that specific quotation up because I think it's really important to see the words that are in his official transcript on his website. Because I know it's crazy to try and parse the precise meaning that politicians may have in the words that they utter. You know all about that in this country. But he, there is no doubt that what he is saying is that no Australians were alive at that time. <coughs> Not now, who can remember it, but there were no Australians at that time. And this is just patently absurd. It's stupid. Um, and needs to be you know, brought out. Yes, Paige. This was great, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, it's, it's, it is not just an ongoing occupation, it is an ongoing something else, because I keep thinking about this obsession these days with Neanderthal DNA, right? We see all of this new genetic work that is kind of trying to figure out if people living in New Guinea have more Neanderthal DNA than people living in Australia, right? I mean, so there's this way in which there is, there is an articulation in that quote that those people were never people like us anyway. Yep. So it's even yep. deeper than that, and it's even yep. deeper than Rousseau. I, I, I'm really, really impressed by all of us that nobody has quite brought that out in the press yet. Please don't tell them that that's the implication of what these studies are, because it really is. Mm -hmm. And it's horrible. I don't have a question either. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any other questions or comments, either for you or for Sergio? Just to, my, you know, I think that was a brilliant, I, I teach a course, takes a whole semester to do that. So <laughs> I'm very, very impressed. I'm not, not sure I could last a whole semester. No, no, I, yeah, it's, you know, it's accumulation of that material. But, but also, I think in, in relationship to so much of what's been said, and I think very particularly it's clear in Australia that the issues about authenticity and entanglement are actually challenges to the authentic, authenticity of contemporary and living peoples to acclaim. Mm -hmm of having some uh, sovereignty, of having continuing rights insofar as they have become like supposedly other people. And so you hear endlessly, if it was so great, they should give back all of the steel. Yeah. And the, so I mean, I think it's actually quite crucial to realize that the museum fetishizing, especially in the early 20th century, of the authentic, untouched, and so on, the museum is quality. easily, I mean, it isn't only that, but it's very easily linked to the political project of um, disabling people's uh, claims. Yes. And I just love that quotation of those two women in the, in the photograph, that, that 
We don't take our clothes off. We don't. We don't, we don't do that. We're, we're, we live in settled society. Mm -hmm. um, and, and why Spencer wanted naked people, you may speculate, but um, it may just be to do with authenticity. But it may be, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Right. There, that was alleged of Roth too, quite yes. famously. Yes. When, uh, Though Roth is less. Yeah. Let's not go there. Yeah, that's a kind of complicated <laughs> story. <laughs> about your um, the Malama and the notion of light, you know, moonlight and knowledge, because that's actually the same for in Maori. I was wondering then, is that, you know, who are the missionaries that move into the region? Are they LMS or Wesleyan, did you say? It was I mean, Wesleyan they, in the Messine, yeah. So the island the, Yeah, the LMS were more in South and Hapa, yeah. So but, is that coming from? Well, I mean, like, um, I think it was a slide that I um, showed um, this man called Lee Vinai, um, who is uh, a Fijian. So yeah. he, you know, he, came from, uh, he came from Fiji. So uh, some of these uh, was like missionaries came from Fiji and uh, from the Cook Islands. Yeah, that's what well. I was thinking. That's exactly what I thought. That they would have moved up. And so that's so, because the other word was clearly not Polynesian. It was the local word, the... Uh, Lumalama? Yeah. Oh, no, Lumala. Oh, Duduwila? Yeah. For darkness? Or for so darkness. It, it seemed like Malama had come through from those. Oh, yeah, I'm not a linguist. But I the other one hadn't, yeah. That, you know, that, I mean, you definitely find like many <coughs> Austronesian world, like many, many related um, words, um, all the way to the Philippines. But, I mean, that's... So you have to pick all that apart in your analysis of it. It's quite <laughs> complicated, isn't it? And can I just ask quickly about the rock, you know, the entrance to the underworld? Was that a... a of limestone. It's a uh, lime. Yeah, it's was limestone. Was there a hole there at all, or was um, it a, there's a, an outcrop? There's not a hole. Um, there is a. Um, there's a little. It's not a spring actually. It's just like a water deposit basically. It's just like rainwater that um, um, remains there. Uh, not so long ago, I was told that there was a tree next to it, and um, they used the leaves of the tree to wipe their faces after washing um, the faces of Baloma and the spirits. So is that common to have in different regions a site like that? Or, uh, you know, is it like a... It's, well, this, like, Tuma is considered the underworld for uh, uh, the whole of the north, the north part of the Messine. Uh, in the south part, there are different, different places that are different, um, so to speak, like underworlds or paradises. Uh, in very mountainous islands, those tend to be summits. Um, yeah, and things. so it's changed um, like it, that's the same. So it changes depending on the landscape. But, yeah. uh, but and is there a notion that that's a kind of anchor, like a navel umbilical cord to the to anchor it in the ocean? Or Not so much. No. Um, what what people uh, what people say is that um, when you go to the underworld, you you live pretty much the same life as you had when you were alive. And there's like a the underworld is a mirror image of the of the real villages. So everything okay. is reversed. So when it's you know when it's day in in the <laughs> Tropic <laughs> Islands, it's it's dark. Okay. It's night in in Tuma. Uh, but otherwise, they say that you have the same villages. Uh, of course, you, you know, um, dead relatives live there, and you know, they know you, and they welcome you as the people from your clan. So, so it's very close. So relationship yeah. yeah. Even well, what, um, I mean, I didn't have time to explain, but it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. But uh, um, uh, after uh, the souls of the dead people have been living long enough in Tuma, they can choose to reincarnate. Uh, they float in the water uh, um, uh, with the waves. And uh, they enter women uh, who are bathing in, mm -hmm. you know, in the sea. Uh, women from the same matric plane, so they're born again within the same matric plane. So it's a cycle. Fred, you had a comment that you were going to interject? You had a. Oh, so I'm just going to ask just about. Uh, you know, when you were you were talking a lot about the um, uh, kind of uh, uh, Christian conceptualizations in local terms, has any have you done any work with uh, missionaries and the uh, process of translation? Because I know certainly from where I work, the search for equivalence doesn't usually come from the local people, but is often a transposition of people looking for some. It's like with with the Stralos and. God finding out chewing it. So I was curious about um, you know some of these um, you know you, you, I think there were two different uh, God was seen on the one hand was a translation of you know one concept but another concept and you know, 
Do you think that that has anything to do with the practice? Yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, um, you know, the, the missionaries were also uh, um, actively looking for uh, um, local concepts and terms that are, you know, good, they could parallel to, um, you know, um, Christianity. The entangling may be coming because there's just so much work on the, you know, these missionaries all, the translators in particular, they come from schools of, of uh, translational practice, and this goes back such a long time with Christians, but that would be another kind of place to to see, you know, whether the Wesleyans are taking particular... Yeah, yeah. It, was de it was definitely the case also because it was Layans and uh, uh, Brown and yeah. Brown, you know, the yeah, people who came to the province, they, they came from Fiji already yeah. and they, they, you know, they stayed in um, New Britain as well. So there were seasoned um, uh, missionaries. And they brought the Polynesian polyphonic singing all over the What's interesting also is that uh, uh, many years later, like, you know, like the, um, the exchange of sermons was initiated by a local, um, a local priest. I mean, the local, not a priest because he's a Protestant, oh, no. uh, reverend, uh, and it was based on the on the um, on, on the Kula networks and the, on the Kula exchange. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> How can we undo this? <laughs> well, uh, thank you all again. Um, thank you everyone for attending. This was really well attended, which I'm usually impressed by. Um, for those of you attending the dinner, it's upstairs on the sixth floor in. 15 minutes, but as for now, just please mingle and ask any questions.